In this lecture, we'll be looking at Rome in the time of Augustus. We'll begin by looking at the changes that he made in the military and his policies for the management of Roman territories abroad. We'll look at his management of authority in absentia, and finally turn to golden age ideology in literary and material culture. So under Augustus, the Roman military underwent substantial changes, and these changes would remain in place really until Diocletian in the third century AD. For the first time, Rome now had really a professional military. It became possible in the way that it is today for Americans to choose being a soldier as a career option, that it was no longer something that you did sort of as part of growing up, that there was a draft, that you were forced to do military service, and then you went on with your life as it happened previously. Now there was a professional military that people signed up for. In other words, it was voluntary. So previously, every Roman citizen was required to present himself for the draft. Um, they wouldn't necessarily be drafted into the military, but had to present themselves. Now that's no longer required. And we can imagine that this was a, a particular relief for a lot of Roman citizens, especially aristocrats, who had seen members of their families killed in the previous century, um, who, who began increasingly to not feel the urge to serve in the military. Um, and it was no longer required, really, to have a distinguished military career in order to have a distinguished political career. Those two things started to become separate. And under Augustus, they become entirely separate. So we now have a military that is staffed in part by provincials, but also by lower class Romans. So no longer really as many members of the senatorial aristocracy. There was a fixed term of service. Um, it started out about 13 years. Eventually, Augustus realizes to make the finances work that it needs to be a 20 year term of service plus an additional five years in reserve. So a total of 25 years, 20 of active service, five years in case you had to be called up, at which point you were then eligible for a retirement settlement. So marriage not permitted, um, the reasons for this seem to have been that Augustus didn't want to deal with the difficulties of moving families. He didn't want to deal with char the claims that dependents would have on husbands on fathers, and so found it easier to just say you can't get married. Um, of course, veterans, once you had been discharged from the service, you were then allowed to marry. Um, when you were discharged after your 25 years, if you were discharged honorably, you received 13 years of pay. This was, in essence, a retirement settlement. It allowed just about every veteran to live for the rest of their lives in some comfort. Sometimes that settlement would take the form of a mix of land and money. Sometimes it was just money. One of the interesting things about Augustus's new military is that he doesn't increase the pay particularly. He doesn't bribe soldiers. One exception to this was the Praetorian Guard, so his personal guard in Rome that he did increase the pay of. He also dramatically increases the pay of commanders, um, so people that were centurions. But otherwise, the sort of average soldier made essentially what they made under Caesar. But now there's a, a set system in place, and he does this in part to get away from the system of bribes, um, the system of, of engendering loyalty that he himself had practiced during the civil wars. Now he makes it so that you're serving the state, and it's the state who pays your salary, it's the state who will pay your retirement settlement. Um, so again, takes power away from the commanders, um, makes it so that the kinds of things that he did, that Pompey did, that Caesar did, aren't really possible any longer. He learns from his own victories, in other words. He also makes sure that soldiers are under the command of family members or what were called new men, so people who came from non-senatorial families were the first in their family to enter onto the cursus norm. In other words, people 
that didn't have a strong family base of support and therefore weren't going to possibly threaten him by getting a legion to revolt. Um, he's very careful to avoid giving senatorial aristocrats any kind of command. And again, this is, is very clearly a response to his own rise to power, recognizing that he will avoid any kind of coup if he makes sure that nobody who might lead a coup has access to legions. During his time, he doubles Roman holdings and unifies the Roman Empire. So when Augustus took over in about 30 BC, the Roman Empire was quite large. He still increases it further, but the problem was that there were, there were great divides, especially between East and West. And part of what Augustus works on is trying to bring these different disparate parts of the Roman Empire together, despite the fact that you have even different languages, Greek in the East, Latin in the West, he tries to create a kind of common imperial ideology. It's not always successful. There certainly are revolts to be dealt with, but under Augustus, we see a period of unique peace, and partly because provincials seem to have just been happy for some stability. They seem to have been happy that there was finally a single person in control, that policies were stable and so forth. Occasionally in his efforts to expand Roman holdings and therefore the tax base, Augustus goes too far. This is particularly the case in Asia Minor and in parts east, um, to some extent also in the northwest, um, in, the, in the sort of Danube region where he encountered significant resistance. But on the whole, he's able to do quite a lot to both consolidate Roman holdings and expand them. And the importance of that expansion is that it increases revenue. In general, he adopted a policy of peace, but he combined that with what we might call preemptive aggression. So in other words, anticipating potential revolts and exercising aggression towards those, those peoples. Um, so it wasn't all sort of butterflies and rainbows with Augustus, but he deployed aggressive action carefully and thoughtfully. And he did it always with the intention of securing peace and stability. Perhaps one of his greatest victories of diplomacy was with the Parthians. Remember that Crassus had lost the standards this was a, a moment of great humiliation for the Romans, and Antony had tried to regain the standards, had failed dismally. Nobody had really been able to successfully deal with the Parthians, and Augustus very savvily recognized that he also probably was not going to be able to engage them successfully. And also remember that Augustus wasn't a great military genius. So he, he recognized that it wasn't in his interest to launch a full-scale military attack of the Parthians. Um, instead, he, tr he negotiates. And he's able, through some, some tough negotiating, he's able to get the standards back in 20 BC. And this is a great victory for the Romans. And it's, it's as if they had defeated the, the Parthians in war. And Augustus's return of the standards is celebrated by the Roman poets as if he had won a military victory. Perhaps one of the, the most memorable defeats during Augustus's regime is the ambush of Varus and the legions that Varus commanded in the Danube region. Um, some, some Germanic tribes managed to attack Varus, take his standards, and just massacre the Roman legions that he commanded. And this, is, this is one of the few black eyes um, under Augustus, but again is an indication that although the Romans were embarking on a kind of world domination, there was still quite a bit of pushback on the edges of the empire, particularly in this northern, um, northwestern um, part of Europe and on the edges of the eastern empire. One of the most important things for Augustus was maintaining presence, and he couldn't be everywhere at all times, and in fact, mostly stayed at Rome. He, again, was not a military commander. He wasn't out on campaign with his troops. He delegated that to others. But he was very savvy about maintaining 
what we might call a virtual presence. So um, creating a presence through coinage, through statues and busts of himself, issuing written decrees, having public inscriptions erected, temples that were dedicated to him in addition to the goddess Roma. But making sure that even if he couldn't be physically present, that an image of him was present. And in fact, we have a tremendous number of representations, visual representations of Augustus. Art historians have been able to really study the evolution of Augustus's physical representation because we have so many examples of this and over such a long period of time. But this also speaks to the effectiveness of this, this campaign, really, that Augustus launched to make sure that people in the provinces knew who he was and knew that he was looking out for them. So it wasn't just that he was ruling the people in Rome, but was also a, a real presence for people in the provinces. He generally discouraged the practice of personal cult, and we'll be talking in subsequent lectures about imperial cult and what it is and how it worked. But we see it beginning really with Julius Caesar and with the deification of Roman emperors, essentially, if we call Caesar the first of them. So after death, the emperors would be deified, and then their family, the family of the Julio Claudians, would be worshipped in a temple setting, just like other gods and goddesses of the Greco Roman pantheon. But Augustus recognized that he wanted to avoid accusations of acting like a god. Again, something that Julius Caesar had done. And so he's very careful about publicly discouraging any kind of worship of him as a living god, despite the fact that particularly in the Greek East, this was common practice. He's careful not to let that happen. So what he says is, if you want to worship me, you can do so, but only in connection with the goddess Roma. So we have a lot of examples, particularly in the provinces, of temples that were erected to Augustus and Roma. And so in the image on the left-hand side of your slide, you have the bare remains of one of these temples. In general, provincials liked Augustus. Um, partly they were just happy for peace. Um, part of it was he was successful in campaign in launching this this campaign of virtual presence, in convincing people that a golden age had been ushered in, that they were witness to this. In the East, people saw him really as a kind of reborn Alexander the Great, as this great world conqueror who was going to unify the world, East and West. And here we have an interesting example of a representation of Augustus from Egypt, where you see him represented really in the local fashion, like as though he were a pharaoh, um, but it's Augustus. And so you see that combination um, and what we would call syncretism of Augustus the emperor with what the Egyptians viewed as sort of the leading um, dominant figure, the, the, the king, in this case, the pharaoh. So as I've alluded to, one of the major things that Augustus does as part of his propaganda is claim to have brought back a golden age. Um, in Greco-Roman ideology, the golden age was seen as this time of primordial peace. So it was sort of back in the olden days. It was a Garden of Eden kind of moment where everything existed in peace and harmony. There was utter stability and prosperity, but without labor. And that's one of the key things. And nobody had to work for anything. It just happened. There was no trade. So one of the, the major things in Greco-Roman literature that signals the end of a golden age is the arrival of ships and trade. But in this kind of Garden of Eden moment, everything just happens naturally, and everybody lives in this happy primordial world. Justice lives on the earth. She's living amongst the people. Um, and sometimes the, the goddess Justice is identified with Astraea. 
And so in poetry, you'll see, and you'll see in, in um, Virgil's fourth eclogue, Austrea is mentioned, but also we see in coinage, for instance, the goddess Justice um, plays a prominent role. And it's described as the age of Saturn. So when you see in, in literature from the Augustan age, references to Justice, to Astraea, to the age of Saturn, what that's tapping into is this notion of a, a return of the golden age. And what's interesting about it is that for Augustus, he sees it as a return, that we've gone through it to the Iron Age, but now we're cycling back to a golden age. Golden Age values that are prominent in Augustus's propaganda include pox, peace. Um, we'll see in a second an example of this. Concordia, um, what the Romans would translate as harmony or concord. Um, this was the everybody getting along nicely. Pietas, um, we translate in Engl our English word piety comes from this, but it doesn't quite have that religious connotation yet. What it really meant in its very essential sense was devotion to family and fatherland. So first of all to parents and then connected to that to fatherland. The most maiorum or respect for tradition. Um, so, and we'll see the ways that Augustus taps into this um, that he's and other emperors as well are careful to align themselves with old Republican values. They constantly claim that what they're doing is, is renewing traditional values. Justice, justitia, libertas, freedom of speech. And then finally, religio, which is religion, but probably more correctly, respect for religion, respect for the power of the gods, and a willingness to participate in it. And that was another really important aspect of Augustus's own self-presentation and of golden age Rome under him, that, that religion played a really central role, and particularly civic religion. And so Augustus devoted substantial resources to building new temples, to rehabilitating old temples and old cults, and drawing attention to doing that, particularly in his res gestae. So one of the most important celebrations of the Golden Age is actually a poem that's written, as we talked about, to celebrate probably the marriage of Antony and Octavia. But it gets sort of taken up, particularly by scholars, to talk about Augustus's Golden Age. And it's written by Virgil, um, who famously is the author of the Aeneid, telling the story of the Julio-Claudian family and their connections to Rome's original founder, Aeneas. But in the fourth eclogue, Virgil writes about the return of a golden age, and originally probably meant Antony and Octavia and their child, but again it gets applied then to Augustus's Rome. And he writes, now the last age by Cumae's Sibyl sung has come and gone, and the majestic role of circling centuries begins anew. So this notion that's very unusual that ages work in a circle, that you can have a return to new ages. Justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign with a new breed of men sent down from heaven. So as though the earth has been cleansed and repopulated, he shall receive the life of gods and see heroes with gods commingling. So this he is the, the this child that will usher in the golden age and himself be seen of them, and with his father's worth reign over a world at peace." So you can see all of this imagery, um, all of these values that Augustus would claim for his own regime, but that are really actually already in place even as early as 40 BC with the Pact of Brundisium. But they're values that Augustus really latches onto and then furthers with his own propaganda and claims for himself that he's the one that has brought in this golden age. So kind of taking over this poem that was originally written to celebrate his rival, Mark Antony. So here we have a great monument to Augustan peace. Um, it's called the Ara Pacis, um, the altar of peace. And you can see this, this is a reconstruction, but you can see this actually in Rome if you go. Um, and 
you can see sort of, you know, this is no tiny altar. This is a, a magnificent building covered with panels that celebrate Augustus, his family, his accomplishments in bringing peace to Rome. And this is just a little panel from the Arapacus showing the family of Augustus and various members who would have been able to be identified through their profiles, through their unique characteristics in a religious procession. So highlighting not just peace, but also the role of religion and the participation of Augustus's family in religious cult. And one of the things that's particularly interesting about this panel is the role, is the presence of children. This is unusual in Roman art, and it signals again that notion of rebirth, that Augustus has brought peace to Rome, that it's a place where it's safe to once again have children, that they will grow up in prosperity, that they will live to adulthood. And here we have what's known as the Prima Porta Augustus, um, because it was found in, in Prima Porta, the town of Prima Porta. Um, and you can see this is a, a double-viewed um, so, uh, double uh, version of the image. On the left-hand side is the original statue, and the right-hand side is a reconstruction of how it would have been painted. So something important to keep in mind when you look at statues from ancient Greece, ancient Rome, is you know all the paint is gone, but these were originally richly decorated. And we can see from the residue what it would have looked like, and so that's how this reconstruction has been made. A couple of things to point out about this. On the breastplate of Augustus, and he's standing in the, in the pose of the military commander, um, holding the rod, giving imperium through the pointed finger. And this is a, a very famous statue and a famous pose. On the breastplate, he has displayed not actium, which would have demonstrated his victory over a fellow Roman citizen, but rather Philippi, his victory over his father's assassins. And pulling on the hem of his toga is Cupid. And this is his half-brother. Remember, he traces his lineage back to Aeneas. And this is a symbol of the, the role of Cupid here on the dolphin is a symbol of the fact that Augustus and the Julio Claudians will trace their lineage back to Rome's original founders, Aeneas, and through Aeneas to Venus. Um, so Venus and Anchises, and of course Venus is the mother also of Cupid, which would make then Cupid one of Augustus's ancestors and a kind of um, he's the half-brother of Aeneas, and I don't know what that would make him for Augustus several generations later, but certainly an ancestor. And Cupid will play, again, an important role in Augustan ideology, in art, and in literature. Um, but you see in this very famous statue this really sort of um, gesture to his, his devotion to his ancestry, um, to his very early ancestry through Cupid, and to his adopted father, Julius Caesar, through showing the defeat of the assassins on his breastplate. 